All right. <clears throat> so if you guys got questions, just go ahead and write them and I'll get to them later. I got a massive headache, so I'm going to do my best here. I'm not going to be, it's not going to be very long today. If you haven't already, join the patreon.com forward slash J Vincent. Uh, just put a video up today on high intensity training versus high intensity interval training, H I I T. A lot of people have been doing that and they don't understand what the difference is. So, give a detailed explanation of what the difference is. And whether or not you should be doing H-I-I-T. Mm. All right, so today I want to talk about weight loss transformations. Because a lot of times I get a, a client and they're under the impression that they're going to have a massive transformation in a short period of time, like a month or two. And the truth is that's unrealistic and physiologically impossible without massive amounts of surgery, usually. So if you get a client that's, you know, 200, say it's a female client, 220, 230 pounds, and she thinks within eight weeks she's going to look like uh, the cover of women's health, there's literally no way for that to happen. Not only in eight weeks, if you get a client that's coming to you at 100 or 220 pounds, she's never going to look like the cover of women's health. And it's just kind of asinine to assume that you can spend 25 years destroying your body, getting fat and gross, and then undo all that damage in two, three months. That's insane. But the reason people think that is because of marketing. So the fitness industry is a very dishonest industry and very dishonest when it comes to the transformations. A lot of the times with these transformations, the photos are highly edited. And in many cases, especially when you see somebody going from fat to ripped, the photos are reversed. When you see a transformation where somebody is fat and then gets ripped, first of all, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors with that picture. But also, generally what these companies will do is they will get a fitness model. They will hire a fitness model who's already ripped and have them get fat. So they'll hire a fitness model, take a picture of him when he's in shape, him or her, and then have them get fat for a series of a couple of months and then take a picture and reverse them to make you believe <laughs> that they went from fat to ripped. So transformations for the most part are fake. And the ones that are real do not happen in six weeks. 12 weeks or 18 weeks. A true fitness, a true body transformation going from obese to fit will in many cases takes at least a year, anywhere from one to two years. Because if you are actually mobilizing body fat, you can lose weight quickly. You can starve yourself. You can not drink water, lose a ton of muscle glycogen and a ton of water and a lot of muscle. But if you're losing weight quickly, 
it is highly unlikely the majority of it is body fat. Body fat mobilizes slowly. Anything that happens quickly is generally muscle glycogen, water, or undigested food in the digestive tract. So you'll see these uh, stupid gimmicks, you know, 30 pounds in 30 days. They're never going to admit to how many people actually achieved that. And they're also not going to admit that those who did achieve that lost mostly water, muscle glycogen, and undigested food from starving themselves. It was not fat. A realistic fat loss um, progress is about one to two pounds of fat per week. But again, this depends on how much body fat you're carrying. It will start to taper off. The leaner you get, the slower fat mobilization will be. If you are 300 pounds, you're going to lose fat very quickly in the beginning. But as a protective mechanism, your body is going to reduce its amount of leptin. First of all, one second. <clears throat> so an important hormone in fat mobilization is leptin. Leptin, <clears throat> leptin is a hormone produced by fat tissue, which signals to the hypothalamus to start to mobilize energy and reduce appetite. It's kind of a negative feedback loop for the body. When the body starts to get too fat, the added muscle tissue produces more leptin. So that way more leptin reaches the hypothalamus. So that way your body stops eating and stops building fat. The reason a lot of this doesn't work and people are so, and people end up getting so fat is because when you're eating a diet high in sugar and refined foods, you have chronically elevated levels of insulin in the bloodstream. Insulin blocks the leptin hormone from reaching the hypothalamus. So now insulin has put a stop to the negative feedback loop that prevents your body from getting too fat. And that is why we have people that are able to reach four, five, and 600 pounds. Evolutionarily, the food that was available in the environment was, did not have the ability to elevate insulin so high for so long to cause this problem. Only within the last 40, 50, 60 years has this been an issue. That is why people can get so big, even though <laughs> physiologically or evolutionarily, the human body isn't even supposed to get that big. And the reason it is getting that big is because of a hormone malfunction. Mainly, leptin not being able to reach the hypothalamus. But leptin is also a reason why fat loss will slow down as you lose weight. The amount of leptin circulating in your bloodstream is directly correlated to the amount of fat tissue you have. The more fat tissue you have, the more leptin you have circulating in the bloodstream. So as you lose fat, you lose leptin. Therefore, the signal is less strong to the hypothalamus and your body is going to burn less fat. So realistic weight loss in the beginning, one, two pounds. I mean, if, if you're, you know, if you're a five foot four woman and you're 250, losing two pounds, maybe even three pounds a week is probably healthy. But, you know, if you're a, you know, six foot tall man, 225 pounds, one to two pounds of fat loss per week is realistic. Don't expect five pounds a week. So this is why transformations in weight loss takes a while. 
because you may lose fat very quickly in the beginning, but as a protective mechanism, an evolutionarily, an evolutionary protective mechanism, your body will reduce how quickly you mobilize fat as you lose weight. So most drastic transformations will take at least a year. When it comes to drastic weight loss transformations, it's not so much about the workout. It's not even so much about the diet. It's about the psychology. So what I found with my clients is I try to get a little personal with them, ask them questions, and try to figure out what is motivating the desire to overeat. What I have found with most cases is a sense of lack of self self worth or value and a severe lack of confidence so if any of you got if any of you guys are um, coaches or whatever and you're dealing with a very obese person it is a good idea to Develop rapport with them, develop a connection with them and a friendship with them if you truly desire to help them and understand what is motivating the desire to overeat and the reluctance to change. And what I found is that it is generally a low perceived value or or low or low perceived self-worth and a lack of confidence basically what happens is people start eating and i asked one particular client that i'm going to show you i'm going to ask i asked her this i said you notice yourself getting bigger slowly over time you have a mirror why doesn't it occur to you when you start to notice to stop? People who get very fat notice they're getting fat. And I was always curious why they didn't say, wow, this is getting out of hand. I need to do something. And what I found was basically the individual says, well, I'm already out of shape unattractive and undesirable. So I might as well enjoy all the food that I want. That's generally the psychology behind it. And when I hear somebody say this, when I've had several clients, this was their reason in the past, they're like, well, I'm out of shape and I'm gross, so I might as well enjoy food. But this is what I explained to them, them that they haven't heard. Is how significantly an obese person's life improves with weight loss. And I went over this when I was talking about fat shaming. Not only... Are you going to feel better about yourself? You are going to be more desirable by the opposite sex. You are going to be more productive in your job. You are going to be taken more seriously and treated with more respect in society and in your job. You are going to be healthier and experience less health complications, obviously. Everything in your life improves drastically when you are in shape. Everything in your life gets significantly worse when you're obese. 
So when it comes to obese people, this is the talk that I believe you need to have with them. I don't think they realize how much better their life can be if they lose weight. And I've noticed when I explain this to them, it's, it's motivating. And uh, I explained this to an individual I'm going to show you who had about 120, 30 pounds of weight loss in a year who literally looks like a different person. This is a real weight loss transformation. It took about a year, year and a half for this to happen. When I first met her, she was about 260 pounds <laughs> up and short, you know, five, one, maybe. And now she's 125 pounds. So let me share the screen. So this is her. This is a client of mine in about a year, a little over a year. So here, two, 2020 is 240 pounds. She was heavier before that. She was about 30 pounds heavier before I took this picture. And she went from that. She went from the here 2020 to here 2021 in about one year. Her life, I assume, has improved dramatically. Look at the clothing. Look at the amount of confidence this individual has now from, a hunt, from, Jesus, 150 pounds of weight loss. Right here, boring, plain clothing, glasses. Right here, shorts, funky shirt, heels, no glasses. This is the, the amount of confidence you get from losing the weight and becoming fit again is absurd. This individual is going to do, obviously, better in dating life, treated with more respect in society. I can almost guarantee they will advance in their job. And all they had to do was watch what they eat and I trained her twice a week. And the purpose of the training for twice a week is not to accelerate the fat loss. While it has a, it, it, an effect on the fat loss, you could lose a significant amount of fat simply controlling your calories. But you're also going to lose a significant amount of muscle tissue if it is not properly stimulated with progressive overload. And if you lose muscle tissue, your metabolism suffers. If you lose muscle tissue, you are not going to have the optimal body composition your genetics will allow. If you lose muscle tissue, your joints are gonna hurt. If you lose muscle tissue, you are going to be low in energy Hormones are going to suffer. The list goes on. So the purpose of exercise and weight loss is not to burn fat. Exercise contributes very little to fat loss, the activity of exercise. The purpose of exercise is to build and or maintain Muscle tissue strength, bone and connective tissue strength, metabolic efficiency, cardiovascular efficiency, as the weight is mobilized through a calorie deficit. This is why, this is why the addition of things like high intensity interval training, swimming, jogging, blah, 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 for weight loss is a waste of your time. Because your body is not going to mobilize much fat. There is a limit to how much fat your body can mobilize a day. And if your diet is correct 
you're going to be maximizing this through your diet. The addition of extra activity is not going to allow you to surpass the ceiling or the limit to how much body fat you can mobilize in a day. This is a fitness industry lie. I don't even know if it's a lie. I think people are just so dumb they don't understand the physiology of fat loss. So this is a little over a year transformation. This is a realistic transformation. Granted, she looks <laughs> literally tiny. 125. That is, for her height, a fit weight. Not healthy. Fit. Better than healthy. If she was about 145, that would be healthy. 140, 135, 140, 145. She went from obese to fit. I don't know many girls my age who are 125. And she did it. That's off. So. If you if you are an obese individual. The best thing you could ever do in your life is to lose weight. Your life is going to improve in so many ways. It is unfathomable until you actually lose the weight and see. Even if it were to take three hours in the gym every day for two years, which it doesn't, it would be worth it. The individual I showed you trained with me twice a week for a little over a year and adjusted her diet based on what I told her to eat. She didn't suffer. And guess what happened? Believe it or not, this is a funny, this is a funny aside for the story. There was a period of time where her weight loss plateaued. Okay. There was a period of time where her weight loss plateaued. I had been telling her to eat a particular way, mostly animal protein and vegetables, and train with me every third day, fourth day. Then her weight loss plateaus. She stopped losing weight. I started to dig a little deeper. Well, are you drinking anything with sugar? No. Are you lying about what you're eating? No. And she didn't. She ate perfectly. Started digging a little deeper. Come to find out, she was doing additional cardio in order to try to speed up weight loss. In the additional cardio she implemented with two high-intensity training sessions a week in a calorie deficit, prevented further weight loss. As soon as she implemented steady state cardio or additional activity for the sake of speeding up weight loss, it began to prevent weight loss and she came to a plateau. Now, why would this be? I'll tell you why. And I told her and I told her, stop the additional cardio, and I can guarantee you within just a couple of days, your weight will start to go down again. She listened to me, and the weight started to go down again. Why is this? Why is the addition of cardio to a high-intensity training approach with a calorie-restricted diet, why does that negatively affect fat loss? This is because... The additional activity will stimulate hunger. Always. First of all, your body will not burn additional calories because your body will adapt via adaptive thermogenesis. And it will upregulate appetite. And many times when people add cardio into their training because they reach a weight loss plateau, many times they stop losing weight because without even realizing it, 
their increase in appetite is causing them to eat more calories, resulting in a neutral energy balance and a weight loss plateau. So as soon as she stopped doing the cardio, she started to lose weight again. And the picture on the left is when that happened. And um, she never did cardio again. And turned out to the picture on the right. So that's a realistic weight loss tran transformation. Um, if you are a coach or a trainer, a lot of times people say, do you have any transformation pictures you can show me so I can see that what you do works? Most of the time I don't because I think they're bullshit. But here's another thing. A lot of people will hire a coach or a trainer or go to a gym and completely remove personal responsibility for their results. They'll come to you and say, hey, I want to look like this. Show me what to do. And then it's they basically put the responsibility in your hands. The clients who are successful take ownership and responsibility for their fuck up. And they maintain the discipline to eat a calorie deficit and consistently train. A lot of people won't do this. A lot of people will come in with a desire to lose weight or transform, but don't even have the necessary discipline or work ethic to do it. So if you own a studio or you're a trainer, you're probably not going to have a tremendous amount of transformations because especially in today's society, there are very few people who have the character to endure discomfort for a long period of time. So when you see these trainers with all these transformations, be skeptical because they're probably fake or they probably sell a cookie cutter program to 100,000 people and 10 of them actually follow it and see good results. And then they use those 10 to market their program while ignoring the other 99,990 people who saw no results. Be skeptical. Anyway, all right. So that's that. I'm going to go over some questions. Look, I wasn't so mean today. <laughs> oh, man. No. All right. I'm going to go through some questions. All right. First question. Yo, no, I'm just kidding. That's not a question. <laughs> um, all right. 17 and trying to gain as much. Lean First of all, those watching, if you haven't subscribed to Patreon, subscribe now. Because you will learn things that you will not ever learn otherwise. I'm not posting this shit on YouTube. Only my Patreon members are getting access to the exclusive knowledge and information. And if you actually care about optimizing your fitness, physique, health, etc., you're going to want to join the Patreon and learn what you will not find on YouTube. Trying to gain as much lean muscle as possible. How many calories under maintenance would you recommend for maximizing leanness while also building lean muscle? I would start, you always want to start low. So here's the problem with that. First of all, the food labels are allowed a 20 to 30% margin of error. So the food companies are always going to put label, they're always going to label less calories than the food actually has. 
So this is why people can think that they're following a calorie deficit and they're not losing weight because they're believing the food label. The food label is not accurate. If you're really serious about it, I would literally measure your calories and then add 20%. And that's probably the amount of calories you're eating. All right. And then from there, start with a calorie deficit of 500 and see if you start to lose weight. So if you want to maximize lean, maximize leanness, you're going to have to lose weight. If you're not losing weight, you're not losing fat and you're not going to come lean. So I would start with a 500 calorie deficit and see what happens to your weight. You want very slow, maybe a half. I mean, this all depends on your size too, um, how overweight you are. But again, half a pound to pound and a half of weight loss per week probably is going to be realistic. Um, my neighbor's blasting his music. I might have to send my dog in there and rip his throat out. What do you think? Oh, he's sleeping. Um, but you can build muscle in a calorie deficit if properly stimulated. Not as much as if you were, you know, or a slight calorie surplus. But yeah, start with about a 500. First of all, measure your calories, your resting metabolic rate. Measure your calories, add 20% to those calories, and then deduct 500 from there. And then stick with that. Can you recommend a four-way split? Not on here. Join my Patreon and I will do that. I don't do that on here. That's too complicated for me to do on here. All right. So my maintenance calories according to my fitness pal is 2,200. How would I know if it should be more or less? We well, have to exp – but that's going to be wrong. So you have to – you have to eat less than that and just see what happens to your weight. There's experimentation. My fitness pal is just such a general estimate that you can't, it's, it's not 2,200. You have to experiment. You have to reduce your calories from 2,200 and then just see what happens to your weight. Let's see. I'm fairly lean now. Just started taking creatine two weeks ago. Will the water held in the muscle via creatine take away the look of being lean? Um, for some people, it does make you appear a little bit bloated. But, again, it depends on how you respond to it. Um, yeah, you're just going to have to experiment with that. I, I can't really tell you for sure. Um, you're going to have to experiment with it. It might make you look bloated. I mean, personally, it has no effect on my physique. Um, but I know people who, you know, gain weight quickly and look kind of bloated. You're going to have to, to try and see. When you see people in third world countries, why do you see them with a bloated stomach considering not eating much food? Um, well, their stomach is bloated, but it's not covered in fat. It's probably bloated due to health issues. Um, I'm not completely sure why that is. I'd have to look into that more, but I would imagine it's uh, it's just due to lack of nutrition or the type of foods they eat or just lack of health. Do nitrates have an effect in the body? How much? I'm not sure. I can't answer. I can't answer that one. All right. In a previous video, you talked about staying in a calorie deficit and building muscle. While you may be able to build muscle in deficit, is it possible to gain weight in a deficit? No. It is not possible to gain weight in a deficit. You are still in a negative energy balance. Is it possible to add muscle tissue as the fat is lost, but it will look more like lose five pounds of muscle, gain a half, a, or lose five pounds of fat, gain a half a pound of muscle with a net weight loss of four and a half pounds. It's not going to be lose a pound of muscle or lose a pound of fat, gain two pounds of muscle. You have, you will always lose weight in a deficit. 
What are your thoughts on TRT? If you have low testosterone, um, I think you should take TRT for sure. Um, having low testosterone will ruin you, ruin many aspects of your life. Energy, sex drive, ability to build muscle, body composition, etc. But getting on TRT isn't going to turn you into the Hulk. Remember that. It's, it's, uh, it's a clinical dose of testosterone, not a super physiological dose. So, you know, they give you a couple hundred milligrams every week, bring you up to normal. You're not going to get on TRT and get jacked like a bodybuilder. But it is extremely beneficial for overall health. All right. See, oh yeah, Derek, go back early in the earlier in the live stream. I debunked this. Adding sprint training into weekly schedule. Haven't done them in a while. How would you recommend scheduling it around hit workouts? If you are adding sprint training in for the sake of improving cardiovascular fitness or losing weight, it's going to have no effect. Probably a negative effect on weight loss because it's going to increase your appetite and you're going to overeat without even realizing it. Um, I'm not going to recommend how to incorporate sprint in a weekly schedule because I would not recommend incorporating sprinting into a weekly schedule. You know, with the additional wear and tear, the additional time involvement, um, the additional um, probability of overtraining, wouldn't do it. Oh. Okay. Well, if you just want to sprint because you like to do it, I mean... Don't do it... Obviously, don't do it on the day you are training. Don't do it on the day after you are training. You're basically just going to have to do it when you feel you have the energy and the strength. So I can't really tell you when um, because I know personally when I train legs, I can't really run fast or jump for at least a couple of days afterwards because they're so weakened. So you'd have to kind of figure out how they feel in that case. All right, my mom is about 5'4". She's in her late 50s, eats little food, doesn't need a lot of sweets, was healthy until after high school. She's overweight now. What does it do? It's due to, mostly due to muscle atrophy. Um, so when you lose muscle, you become less uh, glucose sensitive. You become relatively glucose resistant, um, insulin resistant, um, you have less of a storage tank for glycogen, glucose. Um, your hormones go whack. It's just when you lose muscle is the ultimate recipe for fat gain. She may eat little food, but she probably eats calorie-dense food. So although it appears she eats a little bit of food, she's probably still eating a high amount of calories. So, for instance, you could take a, you know, a muffin. It's like this big. And it could be six, 700 calories. <laughs> it's like half of daily intake. So she's probably eating calorie dense, nutrient deficient foods, while she should be eating nutrient dense, calorie deficient foods like, you know, green vegetables and animal protein, things like that. So that's why she gained weight. Is push-ups and sit-ups an effective daily workout? No, because because it is not progressive in nature. And um, if it is progressive in nature and effectively fatigues the muscle, you wouldn't be able to do it daily anyway. So, no. Okay. Okay. I thought I went over this. So you you don't just arbitrarily or randomly increase weight. So what you want to do is you want to set a repetition range within which you will reach failure. So I always tell people, select a weight that will allow you to reach muscle failure within 8 to 12 repetitions. 
And then once you are able to do more than 12 repetitions, then you add a little bit of weight, maybe 5% increase in weight. Continue with the 8 to 12 rep range again until you're able to do more than 12 repetitions. And then add weight again. You continue to add resistance at about 5% per exercise every time you're able to pass 12 repetitions in good form. That's how you progressively overload. You don't just want to randomly add weight. And also, you don't want to feel the desire to add weight. You know, you could be stuck using the same resistance for several weeks or even several months without an increase. This is normal. And a lot of times when this happens, people want to switch things up, um, try a different exercise, etc. Just keep in mind, you will progressively overload and be able to use more weight pretty quickly in the beginning. But as time goes on, it's going to slow down. So I suggest setting a repetition range, so, uh, select a weight in the beginning for uh, what you're able to reach failure within eight to 12 repetitions. And then as time goes on, every time you're able to do more than 12 repetitions, add a very small amount of weight. All right, so if my resting metabolic rate is 1250, how much calories should I take to be in a deficit? Um, if it's 1250, I mean, you're going to probably want about a 200, 250 calorie deficit. That's a ridiculously, <laughs> your resting metabolic rate is not 1250. I don't know where how you calculated that or where you got that from. Um, the average person actually, actually burns around 3,000 calories a day. But I would start eating 1250 calories a day or 1500 calories a day. Um, so, but again, when you're measuring your calories, add about 20% to everything. So if you're eating a cliff bar and it says 250 calories, multiply that by 1.20 and that's the, and, and write that amount down when you're tracking your calories because the food labels have about a 20 to 30% margin of error. Would you recommend resting as much or as little as possible between each exercise? You want to rest as little as you can possibly tolerate without getting nauseous, sick, or passing out. So as little as possible. Um, always move slowly during exercise, but quickly between them. Keep that in mind. You want to move as quickly as you can without adverse side effects. So you don't want to move so quickly that you feel like throwing up. What do you think about carb cycling for insulin sensitivity? Pointless if you're training, if you're weight training. So resistance training empties so much glycogen out of the muscle tissue that insulin sensitivity improves drastically. Carb cycling in addition to this will have no effect. So resistance training is the most effective thing you can do to improve insulin sensitivity. If you are resistance training consistently, you're doing all you can for insulin sensitivity. Does the tissue that support the muscle grow more slowly than muscle? Why or why not? If you're referring to connective tissue or... Uh, Connective and um, you know joint tissue, ligaments, tendons, bones. I'm not sure, actually. I don't know. I would imagine it grows at about the same rate as muscle tissue, but approaches a limit to how strong I, it can get more quickly. All right, I want to improve my mile run time. Yeah, no, the resting metabolic rate at 1250, that. A 
resting metabolic rate of 1250 is not accurate. I don't know where you had that. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> I want to improve my mile run time, but also want to lose weight. Do I do hit every 10th day or so? I would recommend you practice the mile run maybe once or twice a week. Let's go out there, run a mile as fast as you're able to tolerate, rest a few days, practice again. That's not going to interfere too much with either weight loss or um, strength gains. Improving your mile run is going to come down to simply practicing the mile run. That's all it is. And you literally could probably practice this once a week for, for a period of several weeks or even a couple of months to improve it drastically. Once, twice a week tops. Jay, are you still taking that scheduled call tomorrow morning? Um, if you have like more of a specific personal quest, just email me. Um, Biofitny.com. <sighs> All right, forty-six. All right, so it looks like there's no more questions. Um, again, if you haven't already joined Patreon.com, I know an individual earlier wanted to know a four-way split. If you want me to advise you on a four-way split, join the patreon.com forward slash Jay Vincent. I'll do that for you. If you have any other specific questions that you would like me like me to address personally, join patreon.com forward slash Jay Vincent. If you would like personal coaching through phone or Skype with a personal customized diet and exercise plan, email me at the email below, biofitny at gmail.com, and I will work with you personally on your individual approach. So if you want everything dialed in a, a little more closely, a little more carefully, talk with me personally by emailing biofitny at gmail.com, and we will go over your exercise history, your diet history, figure out what went wrong, and come up with a plan to turn it around. All right, so that's it. Go ahead, like the video, share the video, get this information out there. I'll be doing another live stream Saturday at 10 in the morning. I'm going to be doing live streams every Saturday at 10 in the morning, so keep that in mind. If there's a topic you would like me to cover in the first 20 minutes of the live stream, go ahead and leave a comment below, and I'll consider some good topics. So until Saturday at 10 a.m., see you guys later.